show guy close enough they canceled close enough mm -hmm. after like three seasons or whatever um they canceled raised by wolves they've canceled yes, a lot of but king's very not happy about that a lot of the animation a lot of sci-fi that's not pulling its weight and um you know we're gonna see a lot of a lot of cutbacks like this uh i i still think rooster teeth is toast but that's my personal opinion um and so there could be further consolidation of hbo and hbo max's scripted operations um they said warner brothers Film strategy for HBO Max is under scrutiny with movies expected to get theatrical distribution before going on the streamer. Going forward, remember they were talking they were going to do movies just for HBO Max. Right. And now they're probably like, well, shit, that's not going to make enough money. We better mm. dump they them in. They tried it with, with Wonder Woman. And yeah, we got to dump them in the theater first. Um, they said Zazlav has been keen to change the name of the streamer. Uh, changing uh, HBO Max and Discovery Plus, possibly. A uh, handful of layoffs so far. Of course, he laid off, you know, Ann Sarnoff and uh, Tom Asham Those from were like Cartoon Network. Ago. Yeah, that was well. Tom Asham was just like a month ago. That was guys. Was that a month ago? I thought yeah. it was like a long while ago. It no. all blurs together. Guys. It all blurs together. So Ann Sarnoff ran Warner Brothers movies. Tom Asham was in charge of Cartoon Network. He got laid off. The majority of cuts are start are expected to start August and wrap up by Thanksgiving. Well, yeah. happy holidays. So this is the thing: the people that got let go at the top. That was just the beginning. Mm -hmm. He's just getting more. Well, he up. had to cut how many billions? Like three billion or something? He was supposed three to cut. Three billion dollars. Yeah. yeah. So, here's the thing, and we're entering a recession, and he's probably had a few months to look at the numbers and be like, "This isn't working. This isn't working. This isn't working." Um, now he did bring on uh, Alan Horn from Disney yes. as a consultant, and people were pissed because they're like, "He's spending a lot of money on Alan Horn," but he's probably looking at this like, "Well, Alan Horn was at." at uh, Warner when Nolan did the Batman trilogy. Uh, he oversaw the Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's probably like, at least this guy and then, doesn't and have then And then Disney doesn't have him. Disney doesn't have him. So, you know, um, yeah, they said it's going to be a bigger mess than initially expected. I think you're going to see a we lot of... We were expecting it. It's not a bigger mess than we expected. No, I don't think people understand how badly Hollywood is going to be hurt from the recession uh, I let me just note that they rede oh, redefined it it's not a recession it's the a temporary financial inconvenience <laughs> uh that we're gonna we're gonna the be seeing for the, next... the recession the repression oh my god the repression there you go oh my god it's the great repression because you know uh you're not allowed diverse, to talk about it so you're, diverse repressed. people are the most effective no i meant because you're not allowed to talk about it it's you're the repressing not, it speech. is oh there we go it's a yeah, great it's repression. A great repression that's what we're gonna call it uh warner brothers has already made cuts to its sales division uh, word is division leaders have not been given a head count to hit, but rather told to present a strategic outlook of how their operations can work more efficiently. He's going to bring in the bobs. Fair, but that's a fair thing. That is. You know, we're not telling you who we're going to cut. Just look and see how we can make this a more efficient workplace. That's that's normal. I'm like, well, how's that problematic? I've been there. I mean, I've been I've been management, and I've been told to give budgets and be like, this is what we're spending next quarter next uh three quarters four quarters uh next you know five year projection whatever you know how are we going to get to profitability if you're overspending mm -hmm. you know and which positions in your division uh are necessary and which ones are luxury items you know and which people could get cut if we had to cut people and you do you literally as a manager you make lists of people like here's the a team the b team we need the A team, but if we had to cut some people loose, the B team can go because they're not they're not bringing money. And it money. sucks. And it sucks. It does suck. Uh, they said people are actually. They said it's gonna be. Oh my god. Okay. Unlike Warner Media cuts, the Warner Media cuts following the acquisition by AT and T, Warner uh, Brothers Discovery has not implemented voluntary buyouts as a way no, of reducing money. Yeah. Layoffs are expected to be largely performance based. You mean wait, they're going to actually decide who works and who doesn't before they decide who cut who to cut? Yeah. Well, how dare they? Uh, people are looking back a little wistfully at AT and T. They were bitching and moaning about AT and T for years. Uh, they were a phone company, but they understood that they tended to mostly stay out of our our business. Wait. So how dare they? The phone company knew enough to stay out of our business and let us spend money and. But David Zaslav. Yeah. Won't. David Zaslav. He actually expects us to work. Oh my God! It's this a tyrant. Uh, they said, "Yeah, this is going to be bad." They said, "The uh, pending cuts may appease long skeptical investors at Warner Brothers Discovery, which is like why would they? Why would they? Because if bucks. Warner Brothers Discovery is going to try to cut costs and make it more profitable and get more stuff out there and and trim the fat, why would investors think that was bad? 
Yeah, because look, this is when they announced that they were going to be laying a bunch of people off. And look, uh -huh. stock price went up. We're out. actually we're going to we're going to lay people off based on performance and performance. based on who works. And we're make and and, and three day work week, so you don't even have to come in five days a week, and all this other crap. And they're having they're mad about that. Like, how else are you supposed to determine who get laid off? Yeah, they're talking about J.J. Uh, Abrams. They said the Lost co-creator and his bad robot signed a mega five-year overall deal. Yeah, that, deal. Was a, that was weird. Yep, the Warner Brothers' top executives have been scrutinizing bad robots' output so far, and there's a feeling the relationship may have been mismanaged. Basically, he took a half a billion dollars. It was, it was kind of like a Kickstarter scam. He took a half a billion dollars, didn't deliver shows and movies to Warner Brothers like he was supposed to. But went and did it for other people. He went to his competitor and did a bunch of shit for them. He went to Paramount, and now he's going over to, what, Apple and doing the Speed Racer show and all this other stuff, doing comic books for Marvel, you know, Disney. And it's like, how freaking, talk about mismanaged, like, how freaking stupid were you? You gave the guy half a billion dollars, and he went to your competition. Like, you should have locked him down into an exclusive well, for that kind of money. Well, I like, yeah, because it wasn't exclusive. So I'm yeah. like, but wouldn't he have to still deliver by a certain time frame? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think there'd be an out there for them, but maybe not. Uh, I said sports should be a focus for Turner. Um, oh, here we go. Here we go. Proper management here of DC Comics. Elsewhere, IP will be a huge differentiator going forward. Warner Brothers Discovery has the libraries of DC Comics, Harry Potter, Hanna-Barbera, and Looney Tunes. This is why we're doing another Powerpuff Girls. This is why mm. J.K. Rowling is no longer canceled. Um, this is why I think Alan Horn was brought in to try to start course correcting mm -hmm. DC. A collection matched only by Disney with Marvel, Lucasfilm, uh, with uh, Star Wars and Pixar, and they're going to mismanage it just like those, I'm sure. Uh, proper management of the big franchises is a, is a top priority with finding a DC chief who can revitalize the comic book universe the way Kevin Feige has done with Marvel. Uh, this is utmost of the utmost importance to them. There's been much chatter about new Harry Potter extensions, including a TV series and Zaz Live is understood to have recently met with J.K. Rowling. <laughs> So I'm she's sorry, not. It's funny. She's not canceled when it comes to money. And actually, the uh, the game, the Hogwarts Legacy game, is uh, there's a lot of demand for that. There are a lot right. of pre-orders for that. Because most people aren't on Twitter. Most people aren't on Twitter. Theme parks packed. Universal's packed. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, this sounds like there are going to be fundamental changes at DC Comics too. Like we're gonna we're gonna cut the dead weight at DC. Because, does that include Ezra Miller? Does that include Ezra? Where is people are asking? Ezra Miller, all the drama happened with Ezra Miller, and then Ezra Miller disappeared. We don't know where Ezra Probably, is. Probably, maybe, hopefully, hopefully, Ezra is in a location receiving the mental help that they so desperately need. Hopefully, Ezra Miller is in a padded cell somewhere. Uh, just receiving treatment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they have the other the other person, you know, they, uh, that... that is it, a, is, it a, is it a he now? I don't know. Is, is, no, I mean confused. the girl. I she, don't I know. The now. I don't they know. them, is, I don't know. Is also, I don't know. you know. I think it's one person, I think. You know, getting some help, getting where they are. I don't know. That, that's my hope. I don't know. That's my wish. Uh, so, yeah, but look, the long and short of it, guys, and this was the long of it, the long and short of it is he's going to start gutting these companies the like, a freaking, like a freaking fish. Uh, the media is already starting to complain about the cuts because, you know, we're, but the, the the shield, it's not working anymore. It's performance based. Yeah. Performance based. Yeah. Oh, it's because of racism. No. You know what? People are so tuned out. You've overplayed that hand. People are like, no. Yeah. It's, it's strictly performance based. It's going to be the same with Netflix. The only companies that are the holdouts in this, the only studio, major studio that's a holdout in pivoting the profit is Disney. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna have to, at some point, to get through the recession, in my opinion, they're gonna have to really reevaluate uh, their goals. Yes. Um, anyway, go wrap it Maybe up. get rid of Chip Beck. Get rid of Chip Beck. Uh, please subscribe for more pop culture news, views, and rants, guys. We'll talk later. Bye.
and one who fought for his country. You've been to Iraq? Yes, sir. You were expected to uphold a certain level of behavior. Yes, sir. I would do it from now on, sir. I swear. Why should I believe that? You're talking about taking her virginity. You talk about how sex can leave a nasty mess. You know, the experts would suggest that he knows what he's doing is wrong. He even tells the decoy not to tell her parents. Resta Cruz makes it clear online that he knows what he's doing is wrong. He even tells the decoy not to tell her parents about their meeting because, in his words, it could be considered statutory rape. So you ever been with an old guy before? No, I need you to stay in the, the chair, please. Just please. 
I'm just sit down, please. Please, sir. I'm just divorced. I just divorced. Yes, you're yeah. divorced. Yes. And you have children? Yes. And how old are your children? Three. How old? Three. Three. Please, why don't you just have a seat in the chair? Yeah. When I get there, I know the first thing that I will want to do is take a shower so we can take the shower together. Okay. I will undress you and you will undress me. Yes, sir. For a virgin to have sex, it hurts, so it's better if I put some extra lubricant. Sir, please. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I don't want to bother you no more. Please. I wasn't going to leave. I swear. I was going to just tell you that I cannot do it. Well, that's not consistent with what's here. Page after page after page. Now, you're in the military. Yes, sir. And you've been to Iraq? Yes, sir. Well, you joined the military. You were expected to uphold a certain level of behavior. Yes, sir. I would do it from now on, sir. I swear. Why should I believe that? During my talk with him, Resta Cruz actually gets down on his knees. And I didn't think about it at the time, but looking at the tape, it was almost as if he was getting into the POW position. And now you're in the military. Yes, sir. And you've been to Iraq? Yes, sir. Well, you joined the military. You were expected to uphold a certain level of behavior. Yes, sir. I would do it from now on, sir. I swear. Why should I believe that? During my talk with him, Resta Cruz actually gets down on his knees. And I didn't think about it at the time, but looking at the tape, it was almost as if he was getting into the POW position. And this was a military guy uh, who had served in Iraq. So it made sense that, you know, when in trouble, you revert to this, this position. And I honestly think that's what he was doing. I promise you, with my life, you're talking about taking her virginity. You talk about how sex can leave a nasty mess. You know, the experts would suggest that when somebody does something like this, it's not their first time. It's the first time, sir. I swear. It's the first time. Do you ever watch television? Yes, sir. Do you ever watch Dateline NBC? Yeah, all well, the cops and everything. I know. Do you ever see the, the Catch a Predator show? Yes, I'm not a predator, sir. Well, I'm. I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC, and we're doing a story. Now, if there's anything else you'd like to say... Say it, please. Like hear it, otherwise, you're free to walk right out of this house. No, sir, can I go? Yes, absolutely. Please, don't put this in TV. Don't put this in TV, please. No decisions have been made yet. Please, I please. swear I will never do this again. Okay, I'm going to have to ask you to leave now. Yes, absolutely. Please don't put this in TV. Don't put this in TV. No, sir, can I go home? Yes, absolutely. Please don't put this in TV. Don't put this in TV, please. No decisions have been made yet. Please. I swear I will never do this again. Okay, I'm going to have to ask you to leave now. Decisions have been made yet. I saying? swear I will never do this again. Go home. Yes, absolutely. Please don't put this in TV. Don't put this in TV, please. No decisions have been made yet. Please. I swear saying? I will never do this again. Okay, I'm going to have to ask you to leave now. I swear I will never, never don't put this in TV, please. No decisions have been made yet. I swear I will never do this. No decisions have been made yet. I swear I will never do this again. I'm going to have to ask you to leave now. I will never. Please. Otherwise, you're free to walk right out of this house. If there's any, if there's anything else you'd like to say, please. Otherwise, you're free to walk right out of this house. No, sir, can I go home? Yes, absolutely. Please don't put this in TV. Don't put this in TV, please. No decisions have been made yet. Please. I saying? swear I will never do this again.
I'm going to have to ask you to leave now. No decisions have been made yet. I saying? swear I will never do this again. I'm going to have to ask you to leave now. No decisions have been made yet. I saying? swear I will never do this again. I'm going to have to ask you to leave now. Alright guys, this is John and this is Art Quest Episode 9. In this episode, uh, I'm going to show you how to make a brush in Clip Studio Paint. It's a little different and similar than doing it in Photoshop. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily more intuitive or better, it's simply just different. So I'm going to kind of run through that and, and show you guys kind of how uh, I go about making custom brushes in this program. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to import an image or actually, I'm going to open an image. Um, I downloaded from textures.com this texture here, which is supposed to be seamless. And what I'm going to do is duplicate the layer and Let's see here. I think I'm going to go and remove some saturation here. I kind of want to make it uh, pop a little more. So I'm going to do a new correction layer. Let's do tone curve. I think that should be good. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to go up to, I believe, edit, yeah, register material. Oh, let's merge this down actually, merge the layer below. Uh, so edit, register material, image. We're going to go with use for paper texture. We can use it for both the brush tip as well. And we're going to put it in image material. Uh, let's put it in brush and picture. And texture. Let's put it in there too. And I'm just going to tag it with my name so it's easy to find. So I can just type my name in when I'm searching for it. And all the things I make personally will come up. Hit OK. All right, so we're done with that. Don't save. So for this next part, let's take a, a brush and we're going to Use black and just kind of smear some paint around. I don't like that brush. Let's use this dry, dry gouache one and really try and get some interesting texture going on. Add some little random dots that will 
make this all interesting and get the blender. Kind of smear some stuff around. Try and center this. All right. So there's other ways to do this. You could have scanned in an image of, um, you know, your of of ink. That's what I did for some of my custom brushes. So I, I made some ink splotches on a piece of watercolor paper and scanned it in, and then did what the step I'm about to do. Or you can create the texture in the program itself and create a new brush based off of. I'm using the default wash brushes here. Uh, as well. So I'm going to use um, this gouache brush here and I'm going to duplicate it and I'm going to call it John's Custom Brush Gouache. And we'll use the oil paint symbol, I guess. Um, hit OK. So we have this brush here. We're this is going to be the base brush that we're going to use. Uh, we're going to completely change it to uh, function completely differently than the default uh, gouache brush. But first, we got to save this out. Again, we're going to go to Edit, Register Material, and go to Image. We got it here. We're going to use it only for brush tip. And let's put it only in brush material. And again, we'll use my name so I can find it easily. Hit OK. So now, don't need to save this. We'll go to File, New. Let's, uh, let's do a 2,000 by 2,000 pixel image. We'll increase this to 300. This is going to be where we test the brush, kind of make it do what we want it to do. So now I'm on this brush that I duplicated. And I'm going to go to this little wrench symbol down here. I'm going to click it. We're going to go to brush tip. So right now it has some other sort of material here for its shape. So we're going to click that. And we're going to search my name. And here it is, and hit OK. Then on texture here, we're going to also search my name. And there it is, hit OK. Let's see if we can get something interesting out of it. Let's just leave it there. Let's go back to brush tips shade, no, brush tip. So we have our shape there. Let's You can adjust these kinds of things and you can kind of see in the preview window the effect that you're going to have. You can change like the angle there. I want it to be more round like that. And I want a little more uh, opacity to it. That might be interesting.
and let's see, I think it's an in ink here, where we can test, for instance, the amount of paint uh, and, and essentially how it's going to mix with other colors underneath it. So you can see, this is actually kind of an interesting brush. Let's see here. Let's um let's erase this. Let's get a selection going. And let's make a sphere. See like how painting with this brush works and then you can kind of paint something simple like this and maybe figure out what exactly is this brush functioning the way you want it to. I don't really have an intended purpose for this other than to demonstrate how to make a brush, a simple brush. So I don't have a necessary, necessarily a purpose to this. I do think that it does need some work though. Maybe a little less opacity, maybe a little more color stretch. That kind of feels like paint actually now. See, it's striking this balance that, I, that I'm trying to do with it, where I want it to be uh, blending in with uh, the, the color, but I, underneath, like I want, it, I want to have some blending with that, but I want it to be semi-opaque too, and I, I just think striking that balance is a little difficult. And one. Please, why don't you just have a seat in the chair? Yeah. When I get there, I know the first thing that I will want to do is take a shower so we can take the shower together. I will undress you and you will undress me. For a virgin to have sex, it hurts, so it's better if I put some extra lubricant. Sir, please. I'm leaving. I'm, I'm leaving. I don't know about you anymore. No please. I wasn't going to swear. I was going to swear that I cannot do it. Well, that's not consistent with what's here. Page after page after page. Now, you're in the military. Yes, sir. And you've been to Iraq? Yes, sir. Well, you joined the military. You were expected to uphold a certain level of behavior. Yes, sir. I would do it from now on, sir. I swear. Why should I believe that? During my talk with him, Restacruz actually gets down on his knees. And I didn't think about it at the time, but looking at the tape, it was almost as if he was getting into the POW position. And this was a military guy uh, who had served in Iraq. So it made sense that, you know, when in trouble, you revert to this, this position. And I honestly think that's what he was doing. I promise you with my life. You're talking about taking her virginity. You talk about how sex can leave a nasty mess. You know, the experts would suggest that when somebody does something like this, it's not their first time. It's the first time, sir. I swear, it's the first time. 
Do you ever watch television? Yes, sir. Do you ever watch Dateline NBC? Yeah, well, the cops and everything. I know. Do you ever see the, the Catch a Predator show? Yes, I'm not a predator, sir. I'm, I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC, and we're doing a story. Now, if there's anything else you'd like to say, say it, please. You'd like to hear it, otherwise, you're free to walk right out of this house. Sir, can I go? Yes, absolutely. Please don't put this in TV. Don't put this in TV, please. No decisions have been made yet. Please. I saying? swear I will never do this again. I'm going to have to ask you to leave now. Get on the ground. Please, get, get on, on the ground now. Get down. Get down, get down. All the way down. Get down, down, down. down. down, down, down. <laughs> What's your rank in the military? Staff sergeant. Your staff sergeant? Yes. Do you recognize this receipt? Yes, sir. Is it, is it something you purchased? Is all this stuff in the vehicle? Yes, sir. The Coke, the webcam. How about Trojan? Is that is that Trojan condoms? Yes, sir. So you brought condoms with you? Yes, sir. If the guy talks about having sex with a young teen online and talks about bringing webcams or condoms or alcohol or food and then brings them. Yes. Him, but his sobs. The tears keep flowing as the police arrest him. But his sob story may seem less convincing once we show you what the police find in his truck. Gifts he brought for a 14-year-old. How about Astroglide? Is that some kind of sexual lubricant? Yes, sir. You brought that with you? How about panties and a camisole? Yes, sir. The webcam. Did you buy the webcam? Yes, sir. Why? Yes, sir. You brought that with you? How about panties and a camisole? Yes, sir. The webcam. Did you buy the webcam? Yes, sir. Why did you bring it with you? Because I promised her that I was going to give her one. It was all there in the chat logs that perverted justice provided to law enforcement. Remember, his screen name is Married and Looking for Fun 31. Sit down for me. Um, for I'm me? gonna go with you tonight. Well, hang on, you gotta be patient for that. Just no hug. <laughs> no hug for me. I'm sorry. No hug for me. Why oh, don't you no. have a seat right over there oh, for me? Oh no. Oh no, what? Come on, have a seat. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please sit down. You're sorry for what? I think I know what this is. Please sit down. I'm not. I'm not for that. Seriously, you're probably gonna arrest me. I'm not gonna arrest you. Cops will probably. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not here really to do anything, though. He claims the gear, and no place does it say that she's 19. I mean, you can go through it if you no, find No, I it, believe how, how, how old did she say she was? 13. Wow. Are she says that right off the get-go here. You know, it would, dude, I, I was actually home at that time really right. drunk. I probably didn't even pay attention to So you it. didn't even notice that she was 13? I didn't. Yeah. I have never, ever been with a man. And how old are you? I'm 20, actually, 28, yeah. 28. Yeah. 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 You sure? I'm positive. Yeah. Actually, he's 30. Am I on video? Right now, yes. You're can on. we turn that off, please? No, we can't. 
Whereas I've watched your show on Dateline. I would never do that. So you've seen the show? Yeah, I... I mean, so I you've already... seen the show and you showed up here anyway. I didn't know she was 13. I'm sorry. Oh, come on, though. But it says right there. Could you please turn the camera off? I though? cannot do that. Instead, I remind him who I am. Chris Hansen, Dateline NBC. I'm, I know. Arrest me, please. I'm here. And the big cameras come out. And obviously, because he's seen our reports, he knows what's going to happen next. The cops are here, so you can arrest me if you want. The well, I mean, I know the police is going to arrest me, so where do you want me to go and be arrested? I can explain to the police. I mean, look at me. Do you think I would do something like that? I'm very professional. Well, I see a I'm lot of people coming here who are very professional. Chris, when I, I said, you know, I know who you are. I've seen the show many, many times. I mean, we talk about it at work. I would never do anything like that. Why am I being arrested? I haven't really done anything. Don't you think I should? Because we prevented it. Because we prevented it from happening. So why am I still arrested, though? Because you came up here to prey on a 13-year-old girl. I know, but that part is over, whatever happened. I mean, don't you think I should be let go now? So you can go find another 13-year-old? I have a responsibility. I'm responsible to keep my community safe. You're right. But what happens here in Florida shocks us all. Oh, no. Oh, my God. He brought his son with him. He brought his son with him. He's got his child with him. He's a 40-year-old married man, Clifford Wallach, screen name Photofix. He's here to meet a boy who told him online he was 14. I like oral all aspects. I said giving or receiving. He said both. I said cool. He said you up for that. I said sure. I got to tell you something. And I'm going to tell you just straight up right now. I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC. We're doing a story on adults eating children. And since you have your child here, I'm not going to pursue this. Okay. But I think you know what you are doing here, don't you? No, I'm just doing what they're doing to lose. My point is, because your child is here, I think it'd be best if you just went okay. ahead and left. Yeah, I agree. I never going to do this again. Since the police know the man has his son with him. Sir, right there. You come here. You come here. Let go of the child. A female officer quickly takes the little boy and whisks him away so he doesn't have to further witness his father's arrest. Takes the little boy and... You come here. You come here. Let go of the child. Since the police know the man has his son with him... Sir, right there. You come here. You come here. Let go of the child. A female officer... You come here. You come here. Let go of the child. ...has his son with him... Sir, right there. You come here. You come here. Let go of the child. A female officer quickly takes the little boy and whisks him away so he doesn't have to further witness his father's arrest. Please give me my son, please. He's taken away in handcuffs and brought to the transfer station. Please, I want to stay with my son. No, that's not an option for now, sir. I didn't do nothing wrong. I was okay, going to come and take somebody to lunch. I can't feel my hands, please. Okay. The was it to catch a predator first this man made plans online for a threesome with an underage teen and his adult girlfriend on adults eating children and since you have your child here i'm not going to pursue this okay but i think you know what you are doing here don't you no I'm just doing what they're doing to lose. my point is because your child is here i think it'd be best if you just went okay. ahead and left yeah i agree i'm never gonna do this again since the police know the man has his son with him. Sir, right there. You come here. You come here. Let go of the child. A female officer quickly takes the little boy and whisks him away so he doesn't have to further witness his father's arrest. Please give me my son, please. He's taken away in handcuffs and brought to the transfer station. Please, I want to stay with my son. No, that's not an option for now, sir. I didn't do nothing wrong. I was okay, going to take somebody to lunch. I can't feel my hands, please. Okay, the was it to catch a predator first? This man made plans online for a threesome with an underage teen and his adult girlfriend. Online, he calls himself Southwest Georgia Male, yes. His chat is one of the most graphic and disturbing we've come across. At first, he offers the decoy, Aaron Lynn B., $250. When she asks, why do you want to give me money? He says, because I want you. Then he tells her about another girl he met online. 
She was 15 like you. Her mom was at work. Okay. She invited me over. Had never had sex. Oh. Her and her friend. He goes on to say that the two girls performed oral sex on him, and then he describes in detail how he claims to have taken one of the girls' virginity. And he doesn't stop after he sends pornography. He then introduces the decoy to a woman who calls herself Phyllis, his girlfriend, and says she wants to be there with us. Pursuit of our decoy. I get a chance to get a hug? Have a seat. But as the decoy walks behind the curtain, the man sees our camera crew and runs. He saw Ron. He's coming out. He's coming out. And he keeps on running, even after sheriff's deputies order him to stop. Finally, an officer's taser knocks him to the ground. Finally, an officer's taser knocks him to the ground. After he's arrested, he's taken in for questioning. This man with the incredibly vulgar chat reveals something that, ironically, no longer surprises us. I was a man to send the shirt. I don't want to go to prison. Gary. Yes. What is that? I hmm? My noodles ain't the thing I got. Do what? My noodles ain't the thing I have, Mr. Gary. During our undercover operations, it's not uncommon for potential predators to appear hesitant about walking in the door. He's trying to wave her out to the street. No way. But we've never seen anyone like this man. I'm trying to hit on you and you're laughing at me? No, I'm not. Okay, good. Am I freaking you out? Why would you freak me out? Because I'm 44 and I'm hitting on you. So would you ever fool around with an old guy like me? Once they set up an actual date to meet at her house, Moff 1960 makes his plans very clear. Okay, how about after I come in, I'll strip. <laughs> For reals? Sure, if you want me to. You're kidding me. Nope. You can take your clothes off in the laundry room if you want to. You said you were going to do something for me in the laundry room. Were you lying to me? Mm -hmm. Are you going to back out on me? Because mm -hmm. that's what I feel like you're going to do now. Cautious. Moff 1960 senses something. He's arrested. Put your hand behind your back. So we never get to tell him he's going to be on Dateline. And he wasn't the only one. You've got to stop this. Sit down. Sit. It was really one of the only times. You don't want it. It was really stop. one of the only times. You've got to stop this. Sit down. Sit down. You don't have any. You're free to. You're free to leave any time. It's coming in. That could be the doctor. Go to Mark Three. Have him come towards you. Hey. You made it. Come on back. Good, how are you? This man is 48 years old, married, and a prominent San Francisco physician. It's hard to believe that someone of his stature would show up to meet a girl who said she was 13 and then follow her into the backyard where she invites him to go in her hot tub. Pour me a drink. I'm actually going to put on my suit. Maybe we can get in the hot tub. Using the screen name Tall Dreamy Doc, he lies and says he's 29. Remember, he's really 48. He asks the girl, what bra size do you wear? She says 30B, but it's kind of big on me right now. I'm still growing. He replies, I will kiss them. He and helping himself to a drink. I can't. Oh, jeez. So where are you coming from? San Francisco. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, so there probably was a lot of traffic, do you have huh? A, do you have a towel? As the doctor hey, looks for a towel, here. he spots Dateline's camera crew. You gotta take off. Sir? Sir? Yeah. I need to talk to you for a minute. He runs, but he doesn't get very far. On the ground. I must be on the ground. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Get his keys. I wasn't doing anything. Oh man, I wasn't doing anything. Get his keys. I wasn't doing anything. You're gonna talk to a detective and just yeah, explain that to him already. He's just not. He's failing to. I'm not failing. I'm just really scared. Nothing to be scared about. Nothing to be scared about. No. 
I'm somebody who has never done anything in my life be on a traffic ticket, and you wouldn't be scared? You're in some trouble, obviously. Yeah, I'm in, I, I feel like I'm in big trouble, and I feel like I made maybe a mistake, but I didn't do anything. Detective okay. asks him four more times if he's waiving his right to an attorney. I will answer what I can. And each time he agrees and continues to talk. I'm, I'm not going to play games I'm here. not playing games. I'm scared out of my mind. Right. 40 minutes from Piedmont to meet a 13-year-old that nothing would have happened. Can you expect me to believe that? After, after you talk about having different sexual acts with her? She begged me to come. And I know that doesn't make it right, but... Over to the trailer. Once he's taken out of the interrogation room, an officer dials the doctor's wife and hands him the phone. Honey, I'm in big trouble. I'll explain. You have to bail me out of this normal kind of jail. $30,000 check for me. It was a sting operation. I'll explain it to you. In your head. Don't bring the girls. I didn't do anything, but I did something stupid. <laughs> He moves on to talking about anal and oral Don't bring the girls. I didn't do anything, but I did something stupid. He moves on to talking about anal and oral sex. He asks if he can shave her private parts and later makes a rather bizarre request. Send me a pair of your panties. Lyndon McLeod. You have likely never heard of this man before, but this narcissistic, misogynistic, violent man created a self-insert fanfiction trilogy all about himself. Most of those around Lyndon ignored the glaring red flags, and those who did highlight his concerning behaviour to authorities were seemingly ignored. But in December of 2021, Lyndon would go on to commit a series of violent actions, all of which were detailed in his books. And the consequences behind these actions were catastrophic. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to another video by Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the case of Lyndon McLeod. Now, this case is something. Lyndon McLeod's story is right up there with Randy Stair and Elliot Rogers, as one of the most insufferable perpetrators that I've covered. And so with that said, viewer discretion is advised. And of course, just to let you know that I post solved, unsolved, and strange cases here weekly. So if that's of interest to you, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. So please, take a seat, my friend, and enjoy the coffee here. This is the case of Lyndon McLeod. Incredible landscapes, the Rocky Mountains, and endless days of sunshine. Of course, I'm talking about Colorado. Welcome to Denver, folks. Found near the center of Colorado, the Mile High City boasts more than 300 days of sunshine per year. There are many appealing aspects about Denver, which is probably why, in the most recent decade, its economy has grown by a staggering 19%. But let's not tire ourselves with the boring facts this time, especially when there's so much natural beauty to look at. Hiking is at the top of the list when it comes to Colorado's outdoor activities. Hundreds of trails sprawl across its mountains and forests, where other activities such as kayaking and mountain climbing await. And after a long day outside, Denver's incredible food scene will recharge you for the next one. It is also a city with world-famous breweries, a thriving sports culture, and more than 200 local parks. If you can manage Denver's rocketing prices, then you are more than sure to have fun here. And found within the city of Denver lived a man named Lyndon McLeod. Lyndon was not your everyday man. 
And as much as he'd like you to believe that he was a superhero, his unique differences tend to push him in the opposite direction. Born in the year 1974, Lyndon MacLeod was born into a military family. He spent his younger years overseas, before living across multiple states in the US. And after attending high school in Ohio, he made the move down south to Texas. A rather sharp turn to our story, but by the time Lyndon was in his mid-twenties, he found himself in a cult. This was due to his obsession with his girlfriend at the time, who eventually left him for another man. Rather appropriate for the direction this story will take, but the cult's slogan was, quit bitching, start a revolution. By the late 90s, Lyndon had established himself as a man who loved rock music, the great outdoors, and motorcycles. And that final hobby would come at a cost. That cost came in the form of a neck injury, as one day while on his bike, he was involved in a road collision. This collision left him in hospital for several weeks, which also led to an addiction with opioids, during his recovery and afterwards too. But by the year 2004, Lyndon had moved to Denver, Colorado, where he then took up work in the medicinal cannabis industry on North Holly Street, a move that actually would earn him a lot of money. He stayed in this venture for several years, but getting straight into it, in the year 2013, he ended up losing his managerial position after he threatened his employees with a gun. It was around this time that he met a very special character, a man named Jeremy Costello. Jeremy was a tattoo artist, and while adding another one to Lyndon's skin, the two began to talk. Now, Lyndon loved tattoos and had many of them all over his body, but he was not an artist himself and had no idea how to successfully run a tattoo shop. Despite this, he impulsively decided to invest all of his money into a new tattoo business with Jeremy. And needless to say, this eventually ended up bad for the both of them. Lyndon had a terrible relationship with his employees. He was aggressive, uncompassionate, and dreadfully sexist towards all of his female colleagues. No surprise, but eventually everyone hated him. This is something that will come up time and time again in this video, but he was actually an extremely misogynistic man. He believed women were useless and should have no say in important decisions. Most of his relationships would crumble within months, and despite his own brash personality, Lyndon was also extremely sensitive and held grudges much longer than most. And to add to this, he seemingly had no idea how to manage finances. By the year 2015, he was forced to close his shop, which destroyed his relationship with Jeremy. So I had a very successful business. I had I was an entrepreneur from about the age of 33. I was ruined financially. I went from making maybe 25, 30 grand a month in cash mm -hmm. to zero, all in an instant. And so I had to sell all my assets, including my home. I mean, I was really in a bad spot. You see, my friends just burned me. My girl just burned me. Like, my own family burned me. I mean, the, the details are Byzantine. They're, they're really, really shocking. And, and it shocked me. And so I went to a very dark place and I had all kinds of ideas of what I was going to do in order to uh, make this right. With the unfortunate change in his financial situation, Lyndon retreated from the city and moved to a tiny home up in the mountains of Weston, outside of Denver. Being a fan of the tiny house movement and not having much money to spare, he made his own tiny house out of shipping containers, where he obnoxiously posted about it online. In one post, he said, Most people try to make everything small in a tiny home, but I went the opposite route. I have less things, but each thing is larger. This was made possible because I didn't want a ton of goddamn storage. Storage is code for a woman lives here, and needs a place to put all her modern bullshit that nobody needs. My home has books, guns, and meat. I don't need storage for anything else. Lyndon was already on a selfish and self-righteous path. He had already burned many bridges with former friends and colleagues. But after losing all of his money and becoming isolated in the mountains, his behavior, thoughts, and opinions would all sink to a whole new level. He had also become more open about his views on women. He outwardly hated them and showed no respect towards female well-being. It was around this time that Lyndon decided to become an author. He adopted the name Roman Maclay as an online alias and began to write his own novels. And in particular was a three-part series called Sanction. Now, I've briefly skimmed over the books, and quite honestly, they are absolutely terrible. His opinions are as tragic as his grammar, and the make-believe world he created does nothing but stroke his own ego. 
The main character is of himself, who is, quote, an extraordinarily gifted boy born into an average family. He describes himself as a supreme sigma, with high morality and culture. Advanced AI selects him as the perfect being, and duplicates his DNA into 1.6 million other men to accelerate mankind's development. He also rambles on about alpha males versus beta males, and also describes women as promiscuous people who only think with their heads in the clouds. Lyndon's character also has the same history as Lyndon himself, from birth to the cannabis farm to being screwed over by Jeremy. But the disturbing details do not stop there. His character then goes on a six-month murder spree, killing 46 people, and all of those 46 had wronged him in the past. His books further talk about taking action to start a war on American soil. And meanwhile, in the real world, Lyndon referred to himself as an outlaw and vouched for the book to one day become reality. So maybe all of this was just some sort of sick fantasy, a way for him to vent out all of the negative emotions that had built up in his past. But to many others, it was a glaring red flag. With thanks to these books, Lyndon grew small fame in the Manosphere, a collection of websites and forums that promote masculinity and misogyny and oppose feminism. These are typically populated by self-help hucksters, men's rights activists, incels, and the like. Lyndon would go on to meet many people through this pipeline, where he also expressed his frustrations at those who have, quote, betrayed him in the past. That's how I live now. Yeah. Is I live on... on it's validation. It's validation. It's validation. Yes, because I was alone in the wilderness for yeah. years, yeah. abandoned by my tribe, usurped, betrayed, yep. overthrown, yeah, yeah. like... In a literal sense. Literally. In a literal like, sense. no joke. Yeah. Like, really fucked over by my tribe. Mm. And now I have a new tribe, yeah. and they're loyal to me. Yeah. You know? And I haven't tested the limits of that loyalty, but, but for where we're at now, yeah. they have shown supreme loyalty to me. And through podcasts, interviews, and hanging out, he would allude to and even recognize his own problematic behavior. I live in a weird space. I'm proud of who I am, but I'm not proud of everything I'm about. I have thoughts, I have opinions, I have ideas, I have instincts that I think are wrong. But I have them. They're mine. They're real. Yeah. And I won't pretend I don't have them. Yeah. But that doesn't mean I'm proud of them. I don't know if a person has to deny what they are or embrace it fully. I had to admit, this is who I am, and it's ugly. Although these books were a red flag in their own right, there were many more opportunities for those around Lyndon to notice a deeply troubled and disturbed man. Both local and federal police knew of Lyndon, and authorities had even been called to his home over allegations of domestic violence on more than just a few occasions. 11 times, to be exact, from 2012 through to 2016. Lyndon had also made a series of death threats, which were so violent that the FBI paid a visit to his property. And former friends still following Lyndon online noticed him slowly yet surely slipping into more and more extreme behavior. Appearing on a podcast in 2020, Lyndon described himself as, my personality is so extreme that I'm like the oily rags in the garage next to a flame source. I'm just asking for it, you know? I'm either a beast or a philosopher. I don't live alike in this normal human world. He would also continue with his aggression online, spreading his belief that law enforcement and social norms protect the weak from the strong, and that the weak better buckle up, because, quote, shit is about to get real. By the year 2021, nothing had changed. And in fact, Lyndon was becoming more demanding, more agitated, and more reckless. And although he had moved in to live with two fans, he was subsequently kicked out for becoming, quote, unhinged. Alongside his new partner, Anne, the two of them began to film clips for his next new project, which was a self-protagonist film called War Horse. But as the two grew accustomed to one another, Lyndon's ugly side shone through. After striking her across the face, the two decided to take a temporary break from one another. So while Anne headed back home to Salt Lake City, Lyndon was given $20,000 pocket money, along with her van and motorcycle to continue recording. But after parting ways, Lyndon suddenly fell silent. Anne tried to contact her boyfriend over and over again, but he never replied. Her suspicion grew, 
And just days later, she realized that Lyndon had stolen a further $37,000 through crypto payments. Lyndon had rinsed her for her money. Almost simultaneously with this discovery, a few of those close to Lyndon had also learned that he'd been grooming underage girls online, and that he'd been stealing money from other ex-friends too. Lyndon's addiction to opioids was never fully overcome, but this addiction would peak and trough throughout the years. And by winter of 2021, he was once again heavily abusing the drugs. And by December of 2021, all of Lyndon's problems would collapse in the worst imaginative kind of way. On Monday the 27th of December, only two days after Christmas, the peaceful atmosphere found in downtown Denver was met with Lyndon's wrath. Shortly before 5.25 p.m., a black Ford Econoline pulled up next to the Soul Tribe, a tattoo shop located on Broadway. Just seconds later, the armed man left his vehicle and entered the store. Lyndon opened fire on all that were inside. Alicia Cardenas, Aliscon Maldonado, and Jimmy Maldonado were all shot in the process. And tragically, both Alicia and Alyssa were killed almost instantly. Lyndon stormed out of the tattoo shop, where he then made his way to his next so-called enemy. And just six minutes after leaving Soul Tribe, he arrived at West 6th Avenue, near Bannock Street. This was the location of Jeremy's apartment, and dressed as a delivery driver, he knocked on the family's front door, only to be greeted by Jeremy's wife. Lyndon asked for Jeremy, but she found it strange that the driver had turned up at this time of day, and to a door rarely used by public personnel. Using her wits, she told Lyndon that he wasn't home, when in reality, Jeremy was eating dinner in the next room. Lyndon walked away, but just 10 minutes later, he returned with a sledgehammer. As the family fled, Lyndon fired through several doors of the house, several bullets flying past the baby's crib in the process. Just moments later, the family's truck was also set ablaze. By 5.45 p.m., Lyndon had arrived at a condo next to Cheeseman Park, near East 12th Avenue. This was the home of Michael Swinyard, another man to die in his books. Lyndon breached Michael's home, and tragically, after finding Michael, he shot him. Only 12 minutes later, and at 5.57 p.m., a surveillance camera captured Lyndon pull up outside the Lucky 13 tattoo shop found near West Colfax Avenue. The footage shows him enter the shop, and not even 10 seconds later, exit. Within that time, he had spent an entire magazine into the Lucky 13, killing Danny Schofield, another person to have supposedly wronged him in the past. Barely reported by the media, next Lyndon walked into Ted's at Belmar, went behind the counter, and poured himself a drink. When confronted, he pulled a gun on the bartender before walking out. By now, at 6.04 p.m., officers had located Lyndon and his van at the Wells Fargo bank found in the Belmar shopping area. They tried to contact him, but instead, he fired his gun at the police. Police officers fired back, but Lyndon was able to escape the shootout. He made his way into the Hyatt House Hotel, drew his gun to the front desk worker, and unfortunately shot her. He had no idea who she was, but tragically, Sarah Steck was killed in the process. Lyndon then proceeded on foot to the intersection of South Vance Street and West Alaska Drive. This is where he came across police agent Ashley Ferris. Already hearing of the other tattoo shootings, and on a hunch, Ashley decided to rush to a tattoo shop in Lakewood. She ordered Lyndon to drop his weapon, but instead he shot the woman in the abdomen. Despite being shot, Ashley returned fire, killing Lyndon McLeod almost immediately. And at long last, his reign of terror was over. What authorities were faced with next was the path of destruction left behind. With five deaths and two injuries spread across several harrowing scenes, scores of police tape and hundreds of officers sprawled across the awful aftermath. Denver and the local communities banded together to show their love and support for the victims. And with multiple tattoo shops destroyed, the assault seemed to be targeted. Combining this with the deaths of multiple tattoo artists, 
the 27th of December 2021, came to be one of the tattoo community's darkest days. By morning, the city had come to realise that the shooter was none other than Lyndon MacLeod, and tragically, almost everyone who already knew of him admitted they were not surprised. It probably comes as no surprise to you either, but authorities had countless opportunities to intervene and stop Lyndon from his final actions. His former roommates, who had already kicked him out of the property, had warned authorities already of his growing violent behaviour. He had shared with them that he wanted to attack Denver with a flamethrower, and begin a violent revolution. Many friends and fans had tried to warn authorities about this. Andrew Thiel had grown weary of Lyndon, and had even called Denver police, the FBI, and German police to complain. This man did his very best to address the authorities. Andrew literally created a nine-page document addressing all of his threats with sources. And all of this was an entire year before the attack. It's a terrible shame that no one listened to him. Now, of course, the public would soon learn of his books, and everything seems so obvious in hindsight, but these books would describe the very same actions Lyndon took on his final night. You know, it's strange to think about, but he essentially portrayed his main character as an idealised copy of himself, and then viewed himself as his character. His character followed his history up to the point in time where he had written his books, but then, flipping the scenario, he would then follow his character's actions in the years to come, all the way through to his death. There was one crucial difference between him and his book, however, as he and his misogynistic life were killed by the hands of a female police officer, who by the way, he had shot first. Although she was temporarily paralysed in her right leg after the shooting, Ashley Ferris is now able to walk again, and will hopefully go on to make a full recovery. Jimmy would go on to make a full physical recovery, but he has a new burden instead, as tragically, his wife Alice was killed in the process. Although Jeremy Costello and his partner were killed by Lyndon in his fictional book, the two luckily escaped with their baby in reality. As Lyndon broke his way into their home with a sledgehammer, Jeremy and his family fled through a side door before taking refuge in a nearby shop. This, of course, left them with a tremendous amount of psychological stress after the incident. But nevertheless, the family are glad and feel so fortunate to make it away with their lives. I looked in the peephole and I saw it was like a delivery or a mail carrier. He said, I have a package for Jeremy Castillo. And he kept asking, are you sure? Are you sure? She said, yeah. So we moved into this other room in between the two rooms of my shop and he, shot, he fired six shots through the door at us. I was his, pretty much his number one target. I guess he wanted me to read it to see that in the book, uh, a character was gonna, that was his own name, Lyndon McLeod was gonna kill uh, me and then behead her. I mean, everybody that was involved in this is a victim. We survived it, and I honestly have to thank Jeremy for that, and of course, the Lord. <laughs> Several days after Lyndon's death, his girlfriend Anne received a package from the grave. Inside it were the rights to all three of his books, along with a 47-minute movie he had created. Lyndon may have been a terrible tattoo shop manager and author, and he was just as terrible at movie producing too. His film, which is named Warhorse, was just as nauseating to watch. It's a series of overdramatic bad boy clips very loosely stitched together to create a barely discernible story. And of course, the main character is yet again Lyndon MacLeod. Very briefly showing you some parts of the trailer, dramatically framed scenes show Lyndon drinking whiskey while sheepishly grinning at lightning. He walks down dimly lit corridors, likely in search of his missing ego, and drives alongside big scary trains on his motorbike. The package received seemed to be sent on December the 27th, 2021, the very same day of the attack. And with his film being completed only days before he went on to kill multiple innocent people, it is all too likely that the film was intended to be used to glorify his actions. The movie was initially available for purchase online, but has since been deleted. Lower quality versions remain throughout the internet, but honestly, it's best buried. After Lyndon's death, officers made their way to his former home found in Denver. They were greeted by the home's new owner, who had a story to tell. Apparently, after buying the house off of Lyndon, he found multiple animal skulls scattered throughout the property. He also found multiple gun safes hidden behind walls. They found him to be very weird, and he pretty much completely vanished after selling the property. To quote a rather famous psychologist reviewing this case, Lyndon's business and financial failures were due to his incompetence, arrogance, aggression, and lack of people skills. 
yet he blamed everyone else for what happened to him. He essentially hated all women, beta males, weak men, and those who wronged him in the past. And this left Lyndon very angry and isolated. Without the cognitive ability to challenge his own thoughts or opinions, he in turn became a very volatile man, and became more and more dangerous right up to the end. And sadly, this leads us to the victims of today's case, those who undeservedly died at his hands. Alyssa, Alicia, Danny, Michael, and Sarah. Jimmy Maldonado, who was also shot but survived, remembers his wife Alyssa as light in the shadows. She was sweet and gangster all at the same time, and had an amazing balance. The two of them were planning to start a family together, but that was taken away from them in the mid-blink of an eye. Alicia Cardenas is remembered as a pillar of Denver's artistic community. Wisdom and grace poured from her any time she chose to speak. She was a kind and wise person, and her work and artistic flair will carry on through the many apprentices she taught. Michael Swinyard, a 67-year-old builder, was a quiet man. While introverted and shy, he was also a very good listener and friend. He enjoyed golf and making those around him happy. Both of those things he was very good at. Danny Schofield, a talented creative who worked at the Lucky 13, leaves behind three children and is sorely missed by his children, sister, and the rest of his family. Danny is remembered as a thoughtful man who had inspired many others to become tattoo artists. Sarah Steck did not know Lyndon McLeod. She was a stranger to him, but was shot anyway. At the age of 28, she had aspirations to become a graphic designer. She is remembered as an all-round great human being, beautiful and kind, and there to help anyone in need without hesitation. These five individuals had no chance to protect themselves from Lyndon's actions. And in fact, it is terrifying how quick some of these events unfolded. Whether there was any sort of contention between them and Lyndon in the past, it is certain that they did not deserve to have their lives taken. May the families and friends of Alyssa, Alicia, Danny, Michael, and Sarah find peace in the future. And so that just about wraps up our case today, folks. Thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this case interesting or insightful, then please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. It's always a pleasure to see your thoughts in the comment section down below, so please remember to leave that there. And as always, I'll see you again real soon for another video. Until that moment arrives though, please remember to look after each other and stay safe. Thank you and goodbye. scientists, all that stuff, it just, it comes with that morbid territory. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't faced by anything that was morbid that they could show me. On October the 5th, 2012, Jessica Ridgway vanished while on the way to school from her family home. Her disappearance would spark statewide investigations, but with her abductor so forensically meticulous and smart, he would pass under all radars. Following one slip-up, his identity would be revealed, and as the details of her disappearance emerged, the United States of America would be left in disgust and despair. Sometimes, a sudden change in status or appearance can shock those around you. I'm not talking about something small like a new job or a change in shirt, but when friends of Austin Sig learned that he had murdered Jessica Ridgway, they were genuinely shocked by the news. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to another video by Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the case of Jessica Ridgway. And just to let you know, I post solved, unsolved, and strange cases here on a weekly basis. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. So with that said, let's begin today's video. Grab a coffee, pull up a seat, and sit back. This is the case of Jessica Ridgway. It has been a while since we've been here. Welcome back to Colorado. Found in the heart of North America, the rather rectangular Centennial State is famous for its landscapes, wildlife, and wide range in outdoor activities. 
The Rocky Mountains, which rips through Colorado's western flank, offers incredible views and hiking trails. And if you prefer the city, there's plenty to do here too. It's capital to Missouri. At least for now, Jessica was living in Westminster, and along with her mother and grandmother, the found within the snowy suburbs of Westminster, we find the Ridgeway residence. Jessica Ridgeway was a 10-year-old American girl who, at the time, was living with her mother Sarah and grandmother Christine. Unfortunately, Jessica's mother had separated from her father Jeremiah, in which he himself had now moved to Missouri. At least for now, Jessica was living in Westminster, and along with her mother and grandmother, the three of them lived comfortably in a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house on Moore Street. Jessica's school, Witt Elementary, wasn't too far either, only one mile down the road. Jessica was loved by her family, friends, and teachers. She was described as a caring and happy child. She was empathic and full of laughter. She was also quite mature for her age. Her mother, Sarah, recalls Jessica often acting like a teenager without being one yet. Jessica was an easy child to look after. Despite Sarah being a single mother and also working long hours at a nearby tech company, she didn't have any issues bringing her daughter up. We're moving forward to October the 5th, 2012. Being Colorado, Westminster was already beginning to freeze over for the winter, and despite it being somewhat early, the city was already covered in a thin blanket of snow. Sarah had just returned home from her night shift, and although her hours were flexible, she was home this morning. On the other end of the circadian rhythm, Jessica's alarm struck at 7.45am. It was a school day, so of course she was expected to attend. Her usual morning routine followed. Go downstairs, watch TV, eat a granola bar, and then head back upstairs to get dressed. When she came back downstairs, Jessica and her mother peeled a couple of oranges ready for her school snack, before filling up her water bottle for the day ahead. Sarah ushered Jessica to the front door, reminding her not to be late for the first class of the day. The time was 8.30, but luckily she didn't have far to go. Jessica would usually make the first part of her journey alone, but this wasn't for very long. Her friend Jeremy's house was just a block down the road, and from there, they would walk the remaining half mile together to Whit Elementary. With Sarah working the night before, her main priority was to get into bed as soon as her daughter had left the house. She was tired from the long hours of work, and needed some well-deserved rest. And with that said, getting into bed shortly before 9am, she peacefully fell asleep. Waking up shortly after 4pm, Sarah awoke to some very concerning news. For one, the house was still empty, with no sign of Jessica anywhere. But the worry didn't stop there. Looking down at her phone, she noticed multiple missed calls, and a voice message. Jessica's school had tried to contact her in the morning while she was still asleep, and the message was to ask where Jessica was, as she had never made it to school. Jeremy had no idea where his friend was either, Despite being called by Jessica that morning to confirm her arrival, she never made it to his home. He walked to school alone. There was no sign of Jessica anywhere. As a result, and in a blind panic, Sarah called the police immediately. Yes, yeah, Mr. 911, what is the address of your emergency? It's 10786 Moore Street. 10786 Moore Street? Yeah. Okay, what's going on there? My daughter's missing. Um, I guess she never made it to school this morning. How old's your daughter? She's 10. Okay, what's your daughter's name? Jessica Bridgeway. And when did you last see her? Um, this morning when she left at 8.30. Did she walk? Yeah. And I checked her friend's house that she walked and they're not answering the door. And you said that the school called, so they weren't? And I was night, so I slept through the call. Okay, Sarah, sorry about that. We've got several officers on the way over to um, help you out, okay? Police were soon able to get in touch with Jeremy's father, who in return was able to confirm that they never saw Jessica that morning. This means something abnormal had happened between their home and Chelsea Park, which is right next to Jeremy's home. Sarah confirmed that her daughter had left the home wearing a black jacket, black boots, blue jeans, a black and pink backpack, and at the time did not own a mobile phone. It would take five long hours before all protocols were met for an Amber Alert, and with this finally being granted at around 9pm, the state of Colorado was already in darkness. Both dark and long, the fresh night may be. But that didn't stop Jessica's family, friends, and the local community from beginning their investigation. And so, the search for Jessica Ridgeway was on. 
We start with breaking news. Take a look. This 10-year-old girl missing now for more than 12 hours. A massive search is underway in Westminster. Right now, police, along with the CBI, have issued an Amber Alert. And the reason is this. It's because of the amount of time that has passed since she was last seen. At this point, they do not think she was perhaps abducted by an acquaintance or a relative, even though her father lives out of state. There are no concerns from police, at least at this point. They also do not believe she ran away. They say she is emotionally stable. They say she is a good kid, and that is what's adding to the concern in all of this. We're using every resource we have. We're trying to use air or helicopters that have equipment that can search in the dark. Unfortunately, the weather has grounded those, so we're not able to use that tool. We've brought our fire department in who has equipment that sees in the dark, thermal imaging equipment so they're out searching with that come morning searches were well underway for the missing girl using both law enforcement and civilian volunteers both the equipment and the methods used were extensive there were helicopters thermal imaging cameras and search dogs however despite all of this effort there was no sign of jessica the agony found within their anticipation would not get any better Come the next day, as her disappearance hit the 48-hour mark, Jessica was still nowhere to be found. There was, however, a small glimmer of hope. About six and a half miles away from Jessica's home, and in the wrong direction to her school, a local resident had found a backpack. When officers arrived at the scene, they quickly confirmed that it did in fact belong to Jessica Ridgway, and alongside it, they also found her water bottle. Through several interviews with local residents, they were able to narrow down the time frame in which they believed the backpack would have been dumped, indicating a time between 7 and 10 p.m. on October the 6th, which would have been about 34 hours after Jessica disappeared. To add to the already concerning details, Jessica's shoes and prescription glasses were also found inside this bag, meaning she no longer had the shoes to protect her feet or the glasses to properly see the environment around her. Following the discovery of Jessica's backpack, and as the length of her disappearance shifted from hours into days, the assumption that Jessica had been abducted became stronger. Safe to say that almost nobody thought she had left her shoes and run away. We're also getting a new look at Jessica Ridgway herself through home video, holding a dog or a puppy. Take another look at her. Police asking you to pay attention to what you see in this video. It's been a full four days now since the fifth grader from Westminster disappeared on her way to school Friday morning. Here's another one of the new photos we got. Just several of them released this morning. You can see her walking a dog. You can see a gap in her front teeth. Now they're hoping today to finish searching an expansive open space area near the Rock Creek neighborhood in Superior. That's where the backpack was found on Sunday. They also hope to finish near Jessica's own neighborhood, about six and a half miles south of Rock Creek. During the disappearance phase of this case, there were several unfortunate side stories. To begin with, Jessica's parents were both initially deemed to be potential suspects. Now, naturally, this has to come into some sort of consideration. But with the parents Jeremiah and Sarah now separated, wild speculation started to circulate. The two were very quickly drawn out of consideration. But this was sure to add to additional stress to an already traumatic situation. As the days moved by, Jessica's family were becoming further distraught, further desperate, and further hopeful for some good news. Statistically speaking, around 80% of missing children are found within the first 24 hours. As time proceeds, it becomes less and less likely that they'll be discovered alive. So we can see why the Ridgway family were becoming increasingly restless. And on October the 10th, 2012, Five days since Jessica's disappearance, a harrowing discovery emerged. Found seven miles west of Jessica's home, and close to an assortment of abandoned mines, lies an open area named Patridge Park. It's here, amongst the tall grass, that a small body had tragically been found. Or, at least part of it. The torso of a small female child had been found, but her arms, legs, and head were missing. In fact, as were most of the organs, the torso was now mostly a cavity. It also appeared that the torso had been washed several times. Due to its condition, it would take officers almost two days to identify the body through DNA analysis. And after using Jessica's DNA found within her home, they were unfortunately able to confirm it was her. The conclusion to her disappearance was amongst the worst of all possible scenarios. Jessica had not been found safe or alive, and furthermore, this was no accident. The community of Colorado were now looking at an extremely horrific homicide, and even worse, 
her murderer was unknown. The discovery of Jessica's body really changed local dynamics. Her death became a fresh reminder to children's safety. Parents became more vigilant, and with Jessica's killer still roaming the streets of Colorado, nobody could be sure if he would ever strike again. The hunt for Jessica's abductor was expansive. With more than 500 homes and over 1,000 vehicles searched, the FBI were also investigating over 1,000 leads made through over 2,000 tips. The public were urged to remain vigilant, and to observe those around them by looking for changes in habits, daily patterns, and peculiar absences. If any of these were to ring true, residents were urged to report the name to law enforcement. This wasn't the only thing happening immediately after Jessica's discovery, as in fact, the FBI were very hard at work. It turns out that law enforcement was actually able to discover a second set of DNA from within Jessica's backpack. This DNA was analyzed and then submitted into the combined DNA index system, also known as CODIS. CODIS is a system used to compare DNA to potential suspects or to other crime scenes in which a suspect has yet to be identified. And what they found was intriguing. It turns out that the DNA collected from Jessica's backpack also matched the DNA found from another incident only five months prior. In the afternoon of May the 28th, 2012, a 22-year-old female jogger had been attacked by an unknown man. She had been grabbed from behind, ragged, and then dragged to an underbrush nearby. Fortunately, she was able to scare this individual off and call the police. However, she was not able to identify him, and unfortunately, no further progress had been made. It appeared that this assailant was very smart. He had managed to evade not one, but two separate incidents with the second one being much more brutal than the first. And this was extremely frustrating for law enforcement. They were seriously putting in the hours here. I'm talking about several hundred DNA tests, thousands of man hours, and several agencies all working under one goal. And despite all of this, they were still none the wiser. From hours, into days, and then into weeks, Colorado was in full anticipation to find Jessica's mysterious killer. And they almost didn't, if it wasn't for one single phone call. Hi, this is Molly at Westminster Police. Can I help you? Hi, um, I need you to come to my house. Um, my son wants to turn himself in for the Jessica Ridgeway murder. Okay, what's the address? 10622 West 102nd Avenue. And what's going on there? Now, you not hear me? He just confessed to killing her. I know, I, wa I want you to tell me what's going on. Can you tell me exactly what he said? That he did it and he gave me details and her remains are in my house. Did you see them? No. Is he there with you? Yes. Is he cooperative? Yes. How old is your son? 17. What is your son's name? Austin Sig. Okay, do you think that he's gonna be cooperative with the officers? Absolutely. Okay. Do you think that Austin would talk to me? Will you talk to him? Yeah, hold on. Okay. Hello? Is this Austin? Yes, it is. Can you tell me a little bit about what's going on right now or how you're feeling or, or how did this come about? Uh, I, I, I don't exactly get why you're asking these questions. I murdered. Jessica Ridgeway. Okay. There is, I have proof that I did it. I, there is no other question. You just have to send a squad car something down here and right. I will answer all the questions that you want to ask okay. or anyone wants to ask of me as soon as you just, you gotta get down here. Can you tell me what part of the house that her remains are in? Underneath the house and across this. Okay, did you know Jessica before this? No, I did not. I mean, are, do you have a criminal history of any sort? The only other thing that I have done that before this was the Kettner Lake yeah. incident where the woman got attacked, that was me as well. So, who is Austin Sig? Could he really have killed Jessica? And was he the silent assailant behind these two crimes? Born on January the 17th, 1995, he was only 17 at the time of Jessica's death. And unfortunately, the 17 years before this incident were not happy. 
Living in Westminster, Colorado, he grew up with his mother, Mindy. His parents were divorced, and we'll get to the reasoning in just a moment. Austin was a very strange child. Quite honestly, there are many disturbing aspects to his demeanor. But to save time, I'm going to highlight a few of them which I think summarized Austin well. At the very young age of 12, Austin was caught by his mother looking at pornography, which included minors. He was taken to a Christian therapist, but this interest would silently continue in the background. He was into his music and gaming, often taking the username to Hastvath, Vath meaning monster. He also collected knives and samurai swords. Being a victim to bullying in high school, Austin eventually dropped out, and without a father or mother to properly guide him back into education, he academically slipped. Saying this, he would later go on to earn himself an equivalent diploma. Austin was fascinated with death and mortuary science. This would lead him to attend Arapahoe Community College, where, no surprise, he majored in mortuary science. This fascination led him to do well in his respected field, and shortly after this, he began to win awards in student crime scene investigation competitions. Although Austin was smart at the crime scene, his father Robert seemed to have a bad history of committing them. He had been arrested on multiple occasions, accused of bank fraud, domestic violence, and assault. And although his mother was a supportive figure in Austin's life, she wasn't perfect either. In fact, Mindy was not going to win Mother of the Year anytime soon. She often seemed to laugh off her son's increasingly concerning behavior. She would joke to friends about his fixation with body decomposition. And to add to this, she even revealed that she and her son would practice zip tying together, which, if you ask me, is just freaking weird. In the morning of October the 26th, and following his phone call, police swarmed the SIG residence where they then arrested Austin. It turns out that Austin had become extremely nervous in the days leading up to his confession. When local media reported that police had linked the two cases together, he felt extremely ill and wobbly. Which, yeah, is called anxiety. That very night, he slept in his mother's bed, which is kind of strange if you ask me, before confessing to her and police in the morning. After his arrest, Austin then led police to a crawl space located in his bedroom. This is where, for the last three weeks, he had been keeping some of Jessica's remains. Police would also find multiple broken black zip ties in his Jeep. Bleach and trash bags were also located on his porch, the exact brand and size that Jessica's remains had been found in. The basement in which Austin had spent most of his life in was an absolute mess. Cups, plates, and packaging were all over the place with clothes and random pieces of furniture found throughout. A pair of samurai swords sat above his bed. The jeep in which Jessica was kidnapped was then towed away by officers in preparation for thorough analysis. And as for Austin's interrogation, this is how it went. I used zip ties to zip tie her hands and legs together, and I drove her around for probably a good 10, 20 minutes. I asked her if she had a cell phone, I would lie to her. I would tell her that everything was going to be okay, and I sat there and I stared at her, and I just remember absolutely blankness in my head, having no thoughts, no nothing. I guess, I don't know, the whole idea of being, you know, a forensic scientist, all that stuff, it just, it comes with that morbid territory. Mm -hmm. and. I wasn't faced by anything that was morbid that they could show me. What were you planning on doing that day? I had the attempt of picking up some, um, so any, any female that came across where I was. So I was you were, there. you were out, for a better word, hunting? Yeah, I, that's the only word I can think of. And did you know Jessica? No. Had you ever seen her before? No, not at all. She was wrong place, wrong time. It was all random. I, I, I was. You didn't stop the neighborhood or go mm -hmm. over to that neighborhood and mm -hmm. was looking for her? Mm -hmm. Anytime that I would even see someone walking while I was out in one of those modes, my heart would just instantly start beating really fast and I just, I couldn't think straight. I just. Was, was there a thrill aspect to it? I. I I'm trying to figure that out for a while now. Austin would lay all details on the table, 
It turns out that Jessica was not specifically targeted. He was merely on the hunt to locate a vulnerable individual, abduct them, and then kill them. He described to officers how he spotted her walking to school, lay low in the backseat of his jeep, and after walking past his vehicle, he then jumped out and kidnapped her. Much like the practice he had with his mother, he then zip-tied Jessica's arms and legs together before driving her to his home. They then watched TV for a short while. To be honest with you, after reading the public police report, I cannot stomach sharing the fine details. But in the briefest summary possible, Austin then sexually assaulted Jessica, strangled her, resulting in her death, and then cut her limbs apart in the bathtub, all with a Stanley knife. Some of her organs were then kept in labelled jars, where others were flushed down the toilet. He then waited a couple of days before discarding her backpack in an opposite direction to his home, and after hearing that police were using cadaver dogs and thermal imaging, he decided to remove her torso from his property, again throwing police off of his trail. When the friends of Austin Sig were interviewed, they were very shocked by the news. Like, I could have seen why Jessica trusted him, like, getting in the car with him or yeah, whatever when she took, yeah, because he, like, is it's a nice nice. guy and she would have trusted him. What kind of stuff was computers. he interested in? Um, computers. He loves computers. Video games. He liked spending time with family and his girlfriend and all that. Is he the kind of guy that, that no. could murder no, no, a little he girl? Never no, he's never a smart, we never thought, thought awesome. like, it was no, shocking. No. It he was, was, he was the kid that went around school and, like, the kids who walked down the hall alone, he would walk with you. He yeah. was one of those that always talked to everybody, always said hi to everybody, knew everybody. He was so nice. Was, most of us grew up with him. We would we yeah. went to Wit together, we went to Win Carl, and now we're here. And then we see this going on, we're like, where did this come from? Austin confessed that Jessica's murder was all part of a sick fantasy. And not only was the random attack on the female jogger him, but he also planned to do the exact same thing to her. When being interviewed by detectives, he said that he didn't feel the joy from killing Jessica Ridgway that he thought he would. Due to his age, Austin was not eligible for the death penalty, but prosecutors would of course pursue a life sentence. He admitted to 15 crimes covering his attacks on Jessica Ridgway and the female jogger. These included first-degree murder, sexual exploitation of a child and robbery of Jessica Ridgway, and attempted kidnapping of the jogger. To further outrage the nation, Austin initially pleaded not guilty to his crimes, though in 2013 he would change his plea to guilty. During his trial, Austin was considered to be a sadistic necrophiliac with psychopathic traits, but not necessarily psychopathic. As a result of this case, Austin was found guilty and sentenced to 86 years in prison on top of a life sentence, meaning that his life as a free man ended at the age of 17. He will certainly die behind bars. In the year of 2014, he was transferred to a secret location out of state, mostly for protection over the vile crimes that this sack of shit committed. But enough with Austin. With a case so awful, it is sometimes hard to look past the monster and see the victim for what she was, a 10-year-old girl at the very beginning of her life. From the moment Austin set eyes on her, Jessica had no chance to defend herself. She was young, kind, and trusting, walking just one block to meet her friend before school. Her mother and father described her as their rock, their foundation, their world. She enjoyed playing on her scooter with her dog and her friends at the local park, a park which has since been transformed in her memory. Just down the road from the house that she used to live in, Jessica Ridgway Memorial Park now remembers her and her name decorated in purple as remembrance to her favourite colour. Like many children, Jessica Ridgway was told to be careful with strangers. She was told to scream if anyone tried to grab her. And in a dark irony, those warnings were actually reflected in her school notebook. Within it, she wrote, do not play at the park alone, followed by, watch out for strangers. Scream for help, she did. But tragically, no one was there to hear her. So, what is the takeaway from all of this? Being honest, it is very difficult to derive one in a way that everyone would find acceptable. Jessica was only walking one block from a family house. The chance of being kidnapped here is very small, but the ramifications if this were to happen can quite clearly be catastrophic. This really is a judgement of risk versus probability, and being honest, there is no golden rule. Thank you again for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. 
If you found this case interesting or learned something new today, then please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. What are your thoughts on Jessica's case? Do you think this walk was sensible? Please share your thoughts in the comment section down below. Thanks again, folks, and I'll be back again real soon for another video. But until that moment arrives, please remember to look after each other. Goodbye. What's it like when one of your friends on death row is led away to be executed? Well, you spend, you know, years and years and months and months and hours of every day with a person. You talk every day, hey, what are you doing? And, you know, let's eat something. Let's make something to eat. And, you know, and he eventually comes by one day and like, yeah, I got to go, man. And, you know, when he leaves and turns his back and walks down them steps, he ain't coming back. They're going to kill him. About an hour's drive south of Chicago in the state of Indiana is one of America's oldest and most notorious maximum security prisons. The majority of the 1,900 inmates here are serving long sentences for unspeakable crimes. And when I came at you, I wasn't just going to stick you an inch. I was going to run something all the way through you. Twelve are due to be executed on the orders of the state. For two weeks, I was given privileged access to this dark and forbidding world. I do deserve to be executed. Bottom line, I, I ain't gonna candy coat it. I deserve to be executed. Welcome to Indiana State Prison. My introduction to the prison was dramatic. The man who runs it, Superintendent Bill Wilson, agreed to take me to death row. So this is actually the entrance? This is the actual entrance, and, and it's uh, two floors. Uh, we only have 12 men on, on the row right now. You have to sign yourself in. Mm -hmm. The superintendent comes to death row every week to check on how the inmates are coping. Superintendent, these are the pictures of people on death row? Correct. Uh, these are the 12 gentlemen that are on death row. Um, and it shows their cell location so that staff never have to question where they're at. No staff members are allowed on the unit when the offenders are out. So the offenders actually will secure themselves in the cells, uh, and then their cell doors will be closed or opened as they need to come in or out. Do you like any of these people? Like, um, they're all they're all different in many ways. And I, I guess I don't know the whole idea. Of
grab a, a child buttock in a grocery aisle. No? Okay. So we reviewed video and watched the suspect of this whole thing prior to this incident with the juvenile was inside Subway, bought a sub sandwich, used your debit card. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Somebody used my debit card, you said? Well, you. In a Subway? Yep, on Alaska Walmart Subway. Okay. So walked into the store, the vestibule, goes to the Subway, gets some food, eats and stuff, and goes into the store. Okay. You still want to tell me? You, you have no idea what I'm talking about? Okay. Are you the only one that would have your debit card? Or would you share with people who look a lot like you? I... Uh, huh? No, I don't know. No? Okay. Turn around, put your hands behind your back. <laughs> Dominic, you got taser? You good? Yep. Three or five minutes. Andy, five. we're in custody. We'll take a squad and turn it to Dover. <clears throat> You're under arrest for sexual assault of a minor. Do you have any questions? Josie? Are you injured at all? I don't know. Okay. I think I'm sick and I need help. What do you mean? Like, like you're gonna puke right now or something else? Something else. All right. I'm gonna sit you up, bud. Right. Roll over your side. This way. Hey, let's go up on your butt. We'll stand you up in the concrete. You ready? One, two, three. Uh, there we go. Are you lost? No. I was over at my school and I was like, oh. No. You okay? Yeah. Okay. It's a little windy. I haven't rained in a while. That's all right. Not all after the hour. <laughs> yeah. We're not too far. Okay, I was gonna say, if not, I can get a ride. It'd be good to get some air. What? It'd be good to get some air. No, I was like, <laughs> I was like what did you like just happen? <laughs> yeah, that was pretty quick. I didn't get the run vibe from him, but. All of a sudden? Yeah. Okay. All right, good. Thank you. Yeah, see you guys. Hey, boy. See, I can run for this or something. Josie was charged with felony first-degree sexual assault of a girl under the age of 13 and misdemeanor resisting an officer. He was free on a $2,500 signature bond and could face up to a 60-year prison sentence if he is convicted. Do you enjoy our content and want to see more? Join the Code Blue Cam Patreon for early access to ad-free videos, exclusive content not published on YouTube, behind the scenes, and much more. By joining, it will help with the production, sustainability, and long-term viability of Code Blue Cam. 
See the link in the description for more information. We are truly thankful for all your support. Okay. Yeah. Who's? Do we find? No. I, I just pulled over. I found them. Them. They, they, they were walking in the road. Yes, his face. He actually. Oh, I know where he. I know where he is. I think I'm pretty sure I know which one. He's from that one right there. Oh, good. I'm pretty sure. I hope so. Hey, buddy. I don't know. You want to come to me, or are you good there with her? Oh, look at this. All right, let's go. Let me hang tight. Can you pull over here for me one second? I think I remember this guy. Poor little man. You, does he say anything to you? No, he didn't. He didn't say anything. He's not afraid of us, for sure. He didn't say nothing, though? No. Oh, okay. Give me no. one second. Come here, buddy. But he almost ran out in front of my truck when I was trying to hear he was running in front of their car. Gotcha. Oh, my God. Jesus. <laughs> Give me one. Just hang tight for me one second. And I'll... For sure. He didn't say anything. I know where he is. I think I'm pretty sure I know which one. He's from that one right there. Oh, good. I'm pretty sure. I hope so. Hey, buddy. You want to come to me or are you good there with her? Oh, look at this. All right, let's go. Let me hang tight. Can you pull over here for me one second? I think I remember this guy. Poor little man. Does he say anything to you? No, he didn't. He didn't say anything. He's not a crazy guy, for sure. He didn't say nothing, though? No. Oh, okay. Give me one no. second. Come here, buddy. He almost ran out in front of my truck when I was in front of their car. Gotcha. Oh Jesus. <laughs> Give me one. Just hang tight for me one second and I'll get all your information. Is this where you live? You live here? Do you live here? Yeah. That's where you live? How'd you get out? Is this where you came from? My blue lights, buddy. Look at that. We're gonna we're gonna sit in that car, actually. Can you hang tight with him while I pull my car over here, and we can he can sit in the back of my car for a second? Absolutely is. Come here. Hey, little man. Oh, you poor little diaper. Absolutely. Let me pull my car in here. I'm pretty. I had to. I had to pull over. I had to. No, absolutely. Where was he walking? He was just walking right here. Yeah, get ready to walk into the intersection, and I'm just coming from me somewhere for my doctor's appointment. Okay. It freaked me out. Would you mind giving me a written statement about what exactly what happened? Okay, give me I one second. I definitely will. And I know you're working, so I'm going to try to make this as quick as possible oh, for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to say it's that trailer right there, right. but I was out here for a similar incident, and it was that trailer right there, so I'm going to try to find the mom again. Same child? They were younger, I'm pretty, they were younger, obviously, at the time, but uh, that's why I'm kind of remembering him. You're a godsend today. Yes. Go ahead. Um, you want to sit in the back of my car real quick? In the in the with the blue lights on, all we'll right. put the blue lights on. All right. Yeah. Woo! Look at you, man. I know it's so cool. Right? Look at you. All right. You, you can. You want to sit in your in your car? Okay, Go ahead. Yeah, where it's nice and cold, great. and I'll hang out here with Thank him. You. What's up, little man? You like it in here? Woo! Boom! Push it. Look at that. Where's your mom at? Where's your mom? Where's your mom? Where's your dad? Oh. All right? Hey. You are full of bug bites. It's a truck. Yeah, that's, that's my uh, traffic vest, so I don't get run over by cars, you know? Kind of like what we almost having you. Oh no, the car is rocking. 
It's a hot one out here, ain't it? Woo, look at that. Push it. Is that one on too? Nope, push it. Boom. <laughs> look at that. Pachoo. Oh, get that mosquito. You don't need any more mosquito bites on you, buddy. Slapping down these mosquitoes, buddy. Get off of him. You do high fives? You do knuckles? Ooh, high fives? Down low? Good. I'm primary guy. We gotta try to find your mom and dad. Or somebody. Where they at? Where'd the mom go? Is that your, that's not your mom. Where's your mom? I see a hat. Huh? That's my hat. Give me that hat back, boy. Come on. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. I can't see. That's my hat. Ah, give me that hat. Give me that. Boo. You recognize me? No. You don't recognize me? I was here last time when this happened. You remember that? And your son today was in the street, walking out on US-1, and luckily some nice ladies Daddy. saw him and stopped before he got smushed by a freaking car. You know, what were you guys doing in there? We were just sleeping. Just sleeping? Yeah. Can we get him a new diaper on? His diaper is really soiled. You don't even want to, like, I mean, you can look at it, obviously, but it's disgusting. Like, I didn't even want to walk in there, but I wanted to make sure there was, wasn't another kid in there. Is this the same kid or a different one? No, it's the same kid. It's the same kid that called us last time. He's got a younger sister, I think. She's with the grandparents. So we're going to need to call DCF or the grandparents. Step out of the car for me. Come here. Come on. Step out of the car. Put your hands behind your back. I've had enough of this without both of you. What, is she getting arrested? You both are getting arrested, so get your kid dressed. For, for what? Child neglect. Why? Come on. What do you mean, why? why? I'm seat in the back of my car. I've had enough please. of you guys. Sit in the back. Get in there. Please, please, why? What do you mean, why? Get, get, sit, get, sit in the back of the car. Slide in the car now. Sir. Poor parenting. Add that one to the list. Yeah. Turn around. Come here. You, you're next. For what? Why am, I, why, why am I getting arrested? Child neglect. Put your hands behind your back. What did I do, though? What did you do? It's what about you didn't do. You didn't watch your kid. Your kid's out in the road. This is a history with you two. I mean, this is just a, a circus. All I want was the kid to get some clothes and get changed. What do you you think guys I couldn't even doing? do that. What do you think I was doing? Turn around. That's what you were doing. I was putting clothes on. This is not fair at all. It's not fair. Yeah, it's not fair to your son. That's what it's not fair to you. Have a seat. It's it's just, they're letting him eat old McDonald's that's like 10 years old. They can't get him clothes. But he's walking around with his glass everywhere. You know, this is just ridiculous. My patience is, is done with these two. Any weapon on you, yeah, fella? Yeah. Okay, relax, relax. You got me. Relax. Nice. Nice. Appreciate you. Okay. Mate, this yeah, day. just for everybody's. Your... 
You are under arrest. Here's uh, this male's been stopped with a combat uh, noise. Stay there. Stay there. Don't, Don't check it. I've got the uh, mouth. Don't move. Hands. 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 Hands.